Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Tehami. The 77th session of the United Nations General Assembly is underway and Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Shahbaz Sharif, is in New York to attend this significant session. He will be addressing this August session on the 23rd and he will let the international community know about the pain and the anguish that has been caused by the devastating floods recently in Pakistan. And uh, he had already had a number of bilateral meetings with the world leaders. He apprised them about what can be done for Pakistan in this time of need. Uh, he is also likely to attend a global food security summit and a gathering on COP27 to discuss climate change. He had meetings with the president of the World Bank as well as the managing director of International Monetary Fund. Uh, he's also accompanied by a high-level delegation, including the foreign minister, Mr. Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, who has proposed the creation of a separate loss and damage financing window by the international financial institutions. He said that the recent extreme uh, rainfalls in Pakistan and the consequent floods are a clear manifestation of the climate change. Now, a recent study by a group of international climate scientists has found the evidence that the extreme floods that Pakistan has witnessed during this year's summer are a direct result of climate change. And uh, they have said that the Pakistani floods worsen 50 percent this time because of global heating and there is likelihood of the frequency of such type of devastating uh, catastrophic uh, events happening in Pakistan in a near future. Let's talk about all these aspects with our panelists. We are honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Vakash Shirazi who is an expert in disaster response and we are also being joined on Skype by Dr. Akab Malik, his expert of foreign affairs. Let's uh, begin the discussion with you, Mr. Shirazi. So there is a study um, by the international group of scientists uh, that uh, there is a clear manifestation that climate change is actually the cause of uh, this particular devastating flooding that happened in Pakistan. Before we uh, delve deeper into the discussion, let's play a report uh, and after the report we'll go and discuss uh, various aspects. Shabazz Sharif is in New York to attend 77th session of United Nations General Assembly where he is assertively propagating Pakistan's stance on global and regional issues as well as making the world to critically think about catering the disastrous climate change which has recently affected Pakistan in the worst possible manner. Prime Minister during his visit is also engaging with world leaders on this session. The sidelines and these meetings remain focused on the need to deal with climate change, enhance trade partnerships and Pakistan's intent to strengthen ties with other countries relating to trade and economy. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterresh in the session's opening speech warned about the upcoming winter of global discontent from rising prices, a warming planet and deadly conflicts. Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif thanked United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterresh for his strong advocacy of the plight of flood victims of Pakistan and drawing world's attention to the most urgent actionable issue of climate change. He also thanked President Recep Tayyip Erdogan for highlighting the need for the continued international assistance to help Pakistan deal with the disastrous floods. Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, who is also accompanying the Prime Minister for the 77th UNGA session, has called for huge investments to build disaster resilient infrastructure in Pakistan through coordinated efforts with international development finance institutions. While talking to the CEO of the Development Finance Corporation of the United States, Scott Nathan, in New York, the Foreign Minister said additional capital through institutions like DFC is imperative for addressing the challenge of climate change and development in renewable energy, agriculture and business industry. Briefing the CEO of DFC about the devastating floods in Pakistan and the government's effort to manage the crisis, he expressed gratitude for the flood relief assistance provided by the United States. Just watch the report. Uh, the, the Secretary General United Nations, Antonio Guterres, has had the solidarity visit to Pakistan. He went to visit the flood affected areas in the provinces of Sindh and Balochistan, and he has urged the international community to come to the fore and help. 
Pakistan out. And he also uh, said that Pakistan is not drowning underwater, but also under debt. Also, let's uh, begin the discussion with you, Mr. Shirazi. There is a study by the international climate scientists. They have found the evidence that the extreme flooding Pakistan has witnessed over the last couple of weeks, especially in the month of August, has direct links with climate change. Yeah. Jawad, the, the important thing is this, is the at attribution. The international community has not only scientific attributed the uh, climate change uh, uh, with the uh, super floods in Pakistan, and it has clearly said that the 50% contribution of the climate change may be there in, in super floods in Pakistan. And let me share that it will not be a single episode, there will be more frequent episodes in Pakistan from now onwards, which will affect the agriculture productivity in Pakistan, which will uh, increase the variability of availability of waters in different seasons in, in Pakistan, which will increase the erosion of coastal areas in Pakistan, and rest of the uh, uh, climate uh, effects will also be observed, including the droughts and, 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 and the uh, floods. Uh, ETC. But the problem is that, uh, the question is that were we able to uh, put it effectively in, in, in front of the international community? The answer is we were a bit compromised. Now when the UN uh, 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 United Nations General Assembly has called the 77th session and the prime agenda of the 77th session is about the climate change, we expect that Pakistan will plead its uh, case uh, effectively in front of the international community. And if the international community passes a resolution, it will be a reflection of the uh, intention of the international community towards support of Pakistan. So how, how Pakistan has been compromised? Because we have seen a United Nations Secretary General himself coming in person to visit the flood affected areas and he has urged the international community to go for climate justice. It's not the matter of generosity. So Pakistani authorities have pleaded their case very well on the face of it yeah. because uh, coming of a United Nations Secretary General himself is a clear manifestation uh, that Pakistan put the narrative well? There is no short, short answer to, to this question because we have been supported by the international community previously in terms of Mr. Shirazi, beg your pardon for yeah. the interruption. We have to go uh, on a quick break and after the break we'll resume the discussion from here. Welcome back to Views on News. I'm Jawad Tehamiya. We are joined in the studio by Mr. Vakar Shirazi, expert disaster response. And also we have on Skype Dr. Akab Malik, expert foreign affairs. Uh, before going on the break, we were discussing and Mr. Shirazi was saying that there is more need for Pakistan to plead its case in front of the international community, especially uh, at the United Nations General Assembly session, that what kind of devastation Pakistan has faced because of the floods in the month of August and its impacts. And now let's uh, go to Dr. Akab Malik. Uh, uh, Dr. Akab, what exactly the Pakistani authorities should do before going on the break? Uh, Mr. Shirazi said that we've been compromised, but Pakistani authorities seem to have uh, pleaded their case well that climate uh, changes have induced these massive flooding, which have taken a huge toll on Pakistan's economy. I think, uh, unfortunately, that this is probably just a start uh, of things to come. Uh, and it's a sign of what's going to happen in the world unless the whole world unites and does something about this. And I think there's slow progress on this, but I don't think it's rapid enough. I mean, I, I have personally tried to calculate uh, using various studies and understanding from different scientists around the world, uh, because I'm involved in that community around the world. Um, to see what the impact would be in South Asia, and particularly uh, Pakistan and Northern India. And from what we can gather, um, given the rise of temperatures, for example, in the summers we hit 50 degrees quite reasonably uh, often. And uh, it may be predicted that within 30 years that we would be averaging in the summer hitting 60 degrees C. Now, look at the impact on that. The impact of 60 degrees Celsius in the summers would have a massive uh, repercussions on plant life, on animals as a result. 
Uh, the fact of the matter is plant life cannot grow in such terrible conditions, in such heat. Um, and that, as a result, results in massive food shortages for the population and the lack of harvest and also uh, the lack of food for uh, animal life, which could result in the loss of productive capacity within Pakistan and northern India and desertification of the whole region. Now, now look at the impact on the potential impact on glaciers in, in the Hindu Kush. Imagine such temperatures um, prevailing throughout the summers and the melting of the, the ice and the glaciers would be complete. Um, but, but more significantly, what would the impact be of the melting of the glaciers? Um, one of the major reasons as to why um, the monsoons occur is because the impact of the cold climate uh, and the cold airs where that come across from the Hindu Kush, the Karakoram and the Himalayan mountain ranges. The ice ranges produce that cold air will allow precipitation um, and, uh, and monsoons to occur. When you don't have the glaciers, there will be a limitation on the n amount of monsoons that can occur and the, the rains that could occur in the future. Now, that being the case, you could have more drier summers, less water, less monsoons, even the maybe in the future, in the longer term, the, the complete shutdown of the monsoons in this region, in Pakistan. So look at the impact that can have unless the global community comes together significantly. And this shutdown of the monsoons could have a significant impact around the world. Um, there are knock-on effects. I don't think people tend to understand the significance of meteorology in their daily lives and affairs and how the world's uh, ecosystems work together in conjunction. And what happens is that when one system is impacted, it has a knock-on effect on another system within the global environment and the ecology of the global system. And that means not just our food supplies, not just the animals, but the whole ecology of the region and impacting other ecologies of the region. Imagine you've had a few million people migrating to Europe over the last few years because of the wars in the Middle East. Now imagine, now imagine, hundreds of millions forced to leave their homes in, in Pakistan and northern India. Uh, doc doc Dr. Malik, beg your pardon for the interruption. Indeed, we know the scale and the proportion of the damage and the losses have been accrued because of these devastating floods. Now, when we talk about the responsibility of the international community, since it's been established that the extreme flooding Pakistan has faced this summer was a direct result of the climate change. Now, it happens to be the responsibility of the international community, especially the G20 countries, which uh, the uh, Secretary General also alluded to the fact that 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions are uh, contributed by the G20 economy. Uh, so uh, what responsibility do you think at this point in time, if this time around Pakistan has been hit, it could be any other country, one among the G20 countries as well. What they ought to do, uh, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the statement by the Secretary General? I don't doubt that you're right in this respect. I think that the, the likelihood of other countries being affected significantly will occur increasingly over the few forthcoming years. And as that builds up over time, what will happen is there will be a burgeoning need for the global community to get together and resolve their personal issues with each other and look at the future of the climate and look at the future of the global community in totality for the future. I think this is where the world needs to come together and uh, put down the individual differences and look at what is the impact of the overall environment. Uh, and, and you're right, I think the greater pollutants are in the West and China. There's no doubt about that. And India is a large polluter as well. Now, the U.S. as well. Is, Dr. Malik, your point is well taken. I'll come back and resume the discussion from here. Please hold your point. We are uh, being joined by another participant in the show, Mr. Nasser Ali Khan, former ambassador. Mr. Khan, thank you very much for your time on Views on News. When we specifically talk about uh, Pakistan's case uh, that Pakistan has been hit by the devastating floods because of the climatic changes that are happening and the Pakistan uh, being the least contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions 
How well so far do you think Pakistani authorities have pleaded the case in front of the international community? And what could more be done, especially uh, during the UN General Assembly session? Well, as the foreign minister has stated uh, during this trip to the United Nations, uh, that, you know, all other items that we had uh, previously planned to have on the agenda have been uh, put aside or on the back burner. And all we talk to uh, our uh, partners about now, uh, whether it's uh, bilateral meetings or whether they are multilateral engagements, is about the floods in Pakistan and the relief effort. So, so far, uh, that is all that is being discussed, and I'm gratified uh, to see that the, the Secretary General uh, has played a very, very important role. His uh, visit to Pakistan uh, played an extremely important role. He made some very important uh, statements, uh, especially uh, one that I recall uh, in, in terms of asking for assistance uh, for the flood victims, he said this is not a matter of generosity, it is a matter of justice. So he has played a big part in, in highlighting, and our team uh, in the U.S. right now, in the United Nations General Assembly, has also managed to achieve a great deal. One fact that I, uh, I haven't been able to uh, confirm is a discussion that somebody started from the Secretary General's office uh, is that of a debt swap. Instead of uh, countries uh, giving cash uh, to Pakistan, there is talk of a debt swap. This is something, I think, which is a great idea uh, because, you know, about a third of our budget goes towards debt servicing. And, and if we can have some countries, instead of giving assistance, they can swap uh, that assistance by, uh, you know, cancelling our debt, uh, then this will give us a, a lot of fiscal space and uh, the assistance will arrive much sooner this way. Mr. So Khan, uh, uh, humbly adding to this point, this time around in the budget, uh, the new budget, uh, the debt servicing percentage was increased from around 36% to 45%. That is almost half the chunk of the annual budget. Indeed. So if you remember, in, in General Musharraf's time, uh, when we were uh, allies uh, in the efforts in Afghanistan, uh, we were, uh, a lot of our debt was rescheduled. And just by rescheduling, uh, we got a lot of fiscal space and the economy really picked up. So, I mean, that's a different scenario. But debt swap, if they do this, it can, it can go a long way towards providing immediate assistance to Pakistan. Uh, now, Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zadari has also proposed uh, a separate uh, loss and damage of financing a window uh, from the international financial institutions. Uh, how significant is this proposal, and uh, do you think it would be given here by the international financial organizations? I am, I am hoping that it will. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, President Biden's uh, speech has also talked about debt forgiveness for poorer uh, nations. But you know, uh, you were recently discussing uh, floods uh, that can possibly occur. This very year, the United Kingdom has had unusual floods. Uh, great parts of the United States has had unusual floods, as you can see. So this is definitely a global issue. And I think all nations are waking up to this fact. Uh, but you know, I'm gratified to see that uh, these, uh, you know, the, the, the nations which are better off are certainly, uh, you know, receptive to the idea uh, of uh, helping the poorer nations uh, to, you know, uh, tackle this menace. So, uh, in November in Egypt, COP27 is going to uh, take place and uh, Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zadari has also suggested to make climate change an agenda item. What are the expectations from this conference? I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the world is waking up and there will be, uh, you know, substantial uh, movement uh, at, the, at these conferences. Uh, if you recall, uh, you know, the 
Paris uh, meeting in 2015, uh, you know, the, the countries had pledged $100 billion per year. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these commitments have not been fulfilled. Uh, President Biden has just mentioned that the United States is going to contribute uh, $10 billion uh, to such a fund. Uh, frankly, uh, it, it's better than nothing, but, you know, considering that if, if these countries had pledged $100 billion per year and, and the United States' contribution towards the pollution is about 20%, I think this contribution of $10 billion is not enough. Nevertheless, uh, countries are becoming more and more aware, and, and climate change, uh, as you can see, is, is uh, moving to the top of the agenda in any kind of multilateral engagement. So in Egypt also, I am I'm quite sure that it will uh, play a major, a significant role. Right, Mr. Nasser Ali Khan, former ambassador, thank you very much for your time on Views on News. We really appreciate uh, that. Uh, so, Mr. Shirazi, as you have heard Mr. Khan saying that the uh, United States has pledged $10 billion in the climate, International Climate Fund, but remains to be the 20% um, contributor of the carbon emissions in the world. So, when we talk about contributing $10 billion and then being a contributor of 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. So that, that, that doesn't seem to be bidding well with the kind of damage after you contribute 20% of the carbon emissions into the atmosphere and just giving $10 billion. Is it a, is, is it a good deal? I think that it should be at least proportionate to the, to the amount you have been contributing into the international carbon footprints. And but I believe that... Yes, but you please. have added to the carbon imprint and yeah. they are not going to be reversed. Yeah. But giving $10,000, yeah. that's that doesn't bid well with that equation. I would very clearly say that there is a duality observed by the international community in this. That on one hand, they are putting sanctions and they are trying to put uh, moral sanctions on the developing countries to reduce their carbon footprint and to go towards the green energy solutions which are comparatively expensive for the developing countries. But at the same time, they are the major contributors of the, of the carbon footprints or the greenhouse gases. And let me share that the, uh, the climate change is there, it is not going anywhere. And the developing countries will have to bear the uh, effects of the climate change. And as I shared that they will be more frequent in the future. So international community will have to reflect upon these, these problems and they'll have to contribute more towards the mitigation of these challenges, towards providing the, these countries with the infrastructure or at least assistance to build the infrastructure to divert the floods and to mitigate with the situation of droughts and availability, uh, variability of availability of waters in these countries to ensure the food security in the world which is the major upcoming challenge of so the world. So what are the expectations from COP27? Uh, Foreign Minister Bilabal Bhutto Zadari has suggested that climate change should be an agenda item during this conference. I think that the basic agenda of COP27 or COP conference is climate change or is the climate. But the point is that we have to plead our case on the forum. That and our, our case is very simple. We contribute less than 1% of the carbon footprint of the world, but we are on the top of the list in, in receiving the bad effects of the climate change. So international community will have to support us because it is not because of us. It is the, the climate change is not attributed to Pakistan in any way. It is attributed, as you have mentioned, to, to the great 20 countries of the world. So the great 20 countries will have to come forward and join hands uh, uh, to the developing countries uh, to provide them with an assistance to ensure the food security in the world and to ensure that in the 22nd uh, century uh, the, the, the humanitarian crisis no longer emerge in any part of the world. Right, so when Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zadari says that we should be investing, the international community should uh, form a mechanism in order to invest in disaster resilience infrastructure, what does that mean and how would it be implemented? I think there is a co-responsibility. I, I, I believe that international community will not 
directly jumping in Pakistan or in any other country to build the resilient infrastructure. Pakistan will have to focus on the financial assistance and will have to create its own design and plan to create an infrastructure which can help in disaster resilience in Pakistan. Uh, we can divert the Indus River water for 21 days. We all know it. We can channelize the uh, Rod Kohi floods and we can divert these three major rivers to other three rivers which have been uh, almost dead after the pact with India because the majority of the water is taken by them. So in a way, we can convert this challenge into an opportunity. But we also lack in terms of planning and in terms of implementation. I'll come to this point right yeah. after taking the point of view of Dr. Malik. So, Dr. Malik, when we uh, talk about uh, Foreign Minister's statement of uh, investing in the disaster resilient infrastructure, what does it mean and what can the international community do uh, in order to invest in such type of infrastructure? A significant downturn uh, in general because of what happened as a result of COVID and now the crisis in, uh, in, in the Ukraine, uh, the energy crisis and multiple other reasons where, where the economy has is, is hit a roadblock. Um, and I think we have to be realistic about what we can expect from the international community because um, many countries in the West, for example, who would provide funding to, to such projects and uh, to such initiatives are very much having issues themselves. So I think it's important to realize that we have to be realistic in what we can expect from them. I don't think really in real terms that we'll get that much from them. Many of these countries uh, are significantly catering towards own populations and the uh, cost of living crisis that, that, that they're enduring because of the increase in petroleum, uh, gas and oil prices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that it's a matter of bargaining and negotiating with the right authorities around the world and lobbying for a certain degree of investment in these facilities in Pakistan. But we've also got to realize that other countries are going to face these problems as well. And I think it really comes down to our own responsibility for ourselves and what we need to do for the country in itself. I think that there was over the last many years, uh, a lack of investment in shoring up our facilities, our ability to withstand greater floods. If you remember 2010 and what happened, the devastating floods in 2010, did we really learn anything? Were we able to implement the necessary changes that were, ne that were needed at the time and required to prevent uh, what happened here? Now, it's understandable to say that a lot of this were created by climate change, but also for the fact that our infrastructure has been depleted over many years as well because of economic stagnation, a reduction in the economy in many different ways and lack of investment from our own side. I think it's very important to realize that and take responsibility as well um, because we've been going on a seesaw of political intrigue. So, Dr. Malik, your point is well taken. There are other factors which have uh, contributed to this devastation other than uh, the extreme heating of the atmosphere and the climate change that is happening uh, because we've been cutting down the forests in Pakistan, the water channels, the natural flooding channels have been diverted because there have been encroachments and then there are certain other issues that are associated with devastation as you alluded to the fact that after 2010 deluge Pakistan didn't learn the lesson uh, it should have but there are certain other aspects which are very interesting when we talk about flash flooding it doesn't give you the time to evacuate or respond in a timely manner so that's directly related uh, to heating of the atmosphere that is causing because record downpours have been witnessed this time around somewhere three times uh, uh, more than average and somewhere particularly when we talk about uh, southern provinces of Balochistan and Sindh seven to eight times more than average yes I think I think we need to appreciate that uh, fine this is a case and that we've been affected directly uh, in an immense way but but again like I said before uh, one of the things that we need to recognize is that we need to plan ahead. There was no planning ahead. 
that we recognized that there was a lot of climate change issues that were bound to occur. And I think a lot of this was predicted in advance. Now we needed to put the right infrastructure into place. And that wasn't done in, in effect because we were uh, focusing on other issues that were more immediate rather than the long-term impact of the climate change. I think that's a responsibility of the government and that needs to be taken into account. We can lobby other countries, but they're going to be engaged in their own issues. And, and this is where we have to be self-responsible and become more in tune as a country. We have 200, nearly 30 million people who can help out in this because now they are directly affected and they need to be uh, in tune and involved in the reconstruction of the country. That needs leadership. That needs a better leadership uh, to, to foment this, this change that is necessary. And that means that we have to have uh, a clear understanding of what, what is necessary and a plan, a strategic understanding, a plan to make sure that we don't suffer this in the future. That means we have to look at exactly what went wrong again, as it did in 2010, and now predict that it may happen again and again. So we have to make sure that our own ability to prevent such things in the future is taken into account. We can do this. Nobody says we don't have money. We have lots of money in the country. It's a matter of redistributing that money in the right way. That's a more important aspect, rather than ask for other countries all the time. You know what it looks like all the time when uh, Pakistan asks for money again and again. Other countries get tired. It's called uh, right, Doctor uh, Doctor Malik, your point is well taken. We need to do. We need to learn the lessons from the past as well, and uh, we should bring in those mechanisms and try to build that sort of an infrastructure, uh, helping ourselves internally. Let's uh, take uh, Mr. Shirazi's point on this, because uh, Mr. Shirazi, there has been uh, a statement by uh, some assistant professor uh, from London, uh, who goes on to say that. Uh, uh, the devastation is not because of just one element and one factor because of the climate change. Uh, uh, the people have been devastated where the local socio-ecological systems were already uh, pretty compromised. The infrastructure yeah. was flimsy, was not well constructed. Here is the case. Let's suppose we have uh, constructed the disaster resilient infrastructure uh, all over uh, those areas which have been affected this time around by massive floods. So next time, if such event happens, do you think uh, such a devastation won't accrue? I, th I think that we must understand that half of the problem is attributed to the climate change. And we are responsible for rest of the half of the percent. Because as you have mentioned that we polluted the water courses with, with plantation of trees, with plantation of crops, and we have constructed because there, is, there has been... Uh, beg your pardon for yeah. the interruption. We'll have to take a quick break. Yeah. But rather, uh, unfortunately, we are short of time. And uh, uh, with this note, we come to the end of today's Views on News. Until the next episode, take good care of yourselves.